Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to the Law and Blockchain Podcast, hosted by Amy Wan, CEO of Sagewise, a safety net for smart contracts and consultant for Security Token Academy. Hi, everybody. This is Amy Wan with the Law and Blockchain Podcast. I'm here today with Justin Newton from NetKey. Um, Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here today. Awesome. So, you know, NetKey is a very interesting company because they are using blockchain to solve the AML KYC problem. Um, and for those of you who have been tuning in on the shows that particularly touch the STO industry or the security token offering industry, AML and KYC is something that everyone's talking about. So, Justin, do you want to start off by basically telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your company and, and what it is that you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. So, you know, my co-founder and myself spent a little bit more than 20 years working in the internet space. And, you know, for example, NetKey is my first startup or uh, eighth startup. And, you know, along the way, the two of us have been involved in helping to take uh, four companies public, uh, one together and then three separately. And, you know, we came over about gosh, almost five years ago into the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Well, then it was just called the Bitcoin space, right? Um, but uh, what we did when we came in is we tried to take a look at if this technology was really going to reach the mainstream and going to be as transformational as the internet, which really was our thesis, what were some of the enabling technologies that were going to be required in order for that to happen? And so uh, we had built an early product that was a simple, easy to use naming product called Wallet Name Services, where you could just type in an easy to remember name uh, rather than you know, a complicated wallet address for sending crypto assets. But we very quickly um, added a set of services around identity and particularly identity as it relates to risk and compliance or you know, KYC, uh, Know Your Customer, AML, Anti-Money Laundering, Counterterrorism Financing, Accredited Investor Validation, et cetera. And so uh, you know, just like a, a slight tweak on, on what you said in the intro, uh, unlike some of the other companies in the space, we didn't really come from the standpoint of looking at blockchain and saying what problems in the world can it solve um, we more took a look at blockchain and said what things does it need to get solved if it's going to get to where it needs to be so we're not necessarily doing kyc on blockchain but what we are doing is we're doing kyc for companies that are operating in the space so our tools really help companies automate that validation of their customers be they individuals or corporations and uh, as well as do accredited investor validation, et cetera, and deliver all those results back to a compliance officer in you know, one dashboard entry or one API call. Um, basically making it really easy for crypto companies to be able to meet their compliance needs. Very cool. Um, so let's back up a little bit and kind of unpack this for a second. So first of all, can you explain what AML KYC is, um, what do the regulations entail, when do we need to use it, and how has it been done in the past? Sure. So that could be like an entire podcast by itself. So I'm going to just uh, give you an abbreviated <laughs> version of that. Um, you know, one of the things that makes this topic um, so uh, both challenging and interesting operating in the crypto space is that these requirements actually change based on what jurisdiction both your company is in, as well as what jurisdiction uh, your company's customers or investors are in. So what I'm gonna do is give a little bit of like an overview and high level of kind of some of the similarities globally. But this is definitely an area where, you know, you wanna have a compliance expert that digs in on the specifics of your requirements and your use case for your project. But, you know, the basic requirements that everybody needs to follow, whether they're onboarding somebody into their crypto platform or they're taking an investment in their token sale or STO, um, they, they need to know the following things. 
uh, their customer, their investor needs to present an ID and they need to know that that ID is real and that that government issued ID has not been tampered with. You then need to know that the person presenting the ID is the owner of the ID, right? That they didn't just download someone else's ID off the dark web. From there, you actually need to, you know, run their name and other information through like sanction screening to make sure they're not on a terrorist watch list or things like that, as well as check against other um, watch lists like money laundering lists or uh, people that have been involved in violent crimes, etc. You know, and finally, you'll want to do something called a negative news or adverse media search where you're looking for the kinds of things where, you know, someone might've been involved in a Ponzi scheme or something like that, that may not have landed them on a watch list or sanctions list, but you still might want to be aware of, you know, before allowing them, for example, to invest in your company or product. For a corporation, the requirements are relatively similar. Um, you know, uh, you're, you need to run all of those checks on the corporation itself, getting like uh, business licenses and things like that. But then you need to check into the people that are behind the companies, the underlying beneficial owners, the directors, executives, etc. And then finally, if you're involved in a security token offering uh, in the U.S., you need to end in actually about 50 countries globally you need to do something called accredited investor validation, making sure that that investor has the experience and the funds to be taking on a potentially riskier early stage investment that one of the many of these token offerings are. But to clarify, sorry, very quickly, to clarify the current investor rules are different from the AML KYC rules, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, could you re ask that one more time? Sorry, I, I just wanted to clarify the rules around accredited investor verification are different from the rules around AML KYC, correct? Sure. So, I mean, accredited investor validation is frequently seen as a part of the, the know your customer because it's one aspect of the customer that you're doing. So, you know, you know, their identity, anti-money laundering is one part of that where you're, you know, checking their background and doing counterterrorism financing. And in the case of these, you know, security offerings, accredited investor is just one more leg of that stool. Okay, got it. So you're solving the identity problem generally. We're working on it pretty, pretty broadly for crypto platforms. Yes. Got it. Okay. Sorry. So continue on, on where you were going. <laughs> uh, I think that I had reached the end unless I had missed any of your questions there. Okay, perfect. Um, so then let me, let me ask you, I'm sure a lot of, you know, crypto centric people must come up to you and say, Hey, you know, everything that we've done with crypto on, on blockchain so far, that's all been pseudonymous. We don't, we don't want people to know our identity. Um, do you ever get that reaction and, and what's your response to it? Well, one of, of course we get that reaction and, you know, two, uh, you know, frankly, we, you know, we agree with them. Uh, we actually designed a, a protocol for Bitcoin, uh, BIP 75 that can assist with compliance. And, you know, when we designed that protocol, as well as when we design all of the tools that we've designed, they, you know, build kind of deeply into the way that we've built the tools, the, the concepts of privacy and people maintaining as much control over their data as possible. And so, for example, like in the protocol we designed, BIP75, the data and information is exchanged privately off chain only between the individuals involved in a transaction. So like if I was sending you money, you could know who I was, I could know who you were, but no one on the outside would have any additional visibility into it. And you and I would have only shared that information voluntarily. You know, likewise with the tools that we've built around KYC and AML, you know, we're doing that in support of people who have compliance requirements that they need to meet. And, you know, uh, we don't necessarily write those rules but we do want those companies to be able to continue to operate in the space when they have those requirements. And so we, again, when we built out our tools and our, our, the way that we've designed things, we tried to build the concept of maximal privacy into the way we've designed and built our tools. 
And one example of that would be, you know, once we've finished a, a KYC and AML process and we've delivered those results to our customer and the customer says, we no longer need you to store those results on our behalf, we delete those results from our system, both because we do not want to be, a, you know, storing a lot of identity data. Um, but also because we believe that, you know, people have the right for their data not to be stored all over the place and not to be stored in places where it's not providing them a direct benefit at that time. Cool. One question I got once from, I think, someone who was contemplating STO was, you know, oh, when I when I go and do my traditional um, startup financing around uh, it doesn't seem like I have to do AML KYC, but I suddenly have to do it for an STO. Um, can you explain why that is? Why when someone goes through, uh, you know, the regular banking process, um, the bank kind of builds in, the, builds in that check for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two things that are, are going on there that uh, are playing together. And, and you've highlighted uh, one of them, which is definitely one of the, the largest issues that arises, which is, you know, when you're in the banking system, if, if I wire you $10,000 from my, let's say my uh, Wells Fargo account or my Chase account, and I send you that 10K, you know, your bank or your financial institution um, believes that my bank, Chase or Wells Fargo or whoever it is, has done some level of diligence on me, as well as some level of diligence on that source of funds, right? That I didn't show up with like a, you know, a basket full of hundred dollar bills and then use that to wire it to you. Or if I did show up with a basket full of hundred dollar bills, they sort of checked into where they mm -hmm. came from, right? So there's this source of funds question that comes up. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's believed that the bank has already done that source of funds diligence if you're involved in a wire. Um, so the second issue that comes up, which I, I think is is as big or a larger challenge, is you know if if you had invested in uh, NetKey's seed round, right, which we did in June of 2016, um, your ability to use that investment as a way to hide and to move funds around is pretty minimal given that since that time, there's been no liquidity, right, in NetKey as a private company. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's not a good money laundering or money transferring tool that could be used to hide crime. Um, you know, in the case of an STO where I'm being issued a token that I might then be able to exchange either, or, you know, I might be able to transfer either off an exchange or on exchanges with very light controls, the money laundering or terrorism financing risk that that token poses is much higher than a normal private stock, which is incredibly illiquid and immobile. Interesting. So then my next question is in 2017, there were all these people running around um, trying to do an ICO, you know, uh, unregulated. They were just taking crypto from anywhere and they were not in compliance with a lot of regulations um, around, you know, AML and KYC. So what then? Are they essentially unbankable and, and how can they go around and correct this? What's the consequence of their having raised money in a totally unregulated manner? Well, so, you know, not every company that did an ICO in 2017 or, you know, and men, most of the large raisers did not just accept crypto from anywhere. You know, they did have KYC and AML policies. Uh, many of them use, use tools, either our tools or tools similar to ours. Um, and so it, it wasn't a completely open market that way. The beginning of the year was kind of that way. The end of the year was, was definitely a little mm -hmm. bit better. Um, but, you know, yeah. we did know, um, I, I've spoken to an entrepreneur, for example, who did a you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, token sale and ICO, and they didn't collect any of the information on the people that invested in them, et cetera. And they've literally been unable to open a bank account since then. And it, it's been over a year. Um, and it's because wow. they can't prove provenance or source of funds. You know, now they're, you know, they're managing to operate in the meantime by paying people in crypto, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and then, you know, those individuals seem to be able to convert what they need to be able to convert. Uh, but, uh, you know, that definitely is, is a risk. Um, I actually had someone come up to me at a conference in maybe last December or so. And they're like, Hey, I did a token sale and I didn't do KYC and AML. What should I do? I'm like, you should talk to a lawyer. And they said, <laughs> well, I'm like, well, did you, you, it's over. They're like, yeah, it's over. I'm like, did you distribute tokens? They're like, yeah, I distributed tokens. I'm like, yeah, you, oh should, my God. you should definitely talk to a lawyer. They're like, well, I talked to lawyers beforehand. They all told me I should do KYC and AML. I'm like, oh my, oh my God. God, what's going on here? I'm like, well, you should still talk to one now. Even if they told you not to beforehand, they'll still talk to you. You should talk to a lawyer. And he goes away. He came back by my booth about 45 minutes later. He goes, I'm thinking of fleeing to Malta. I'm like, oh my God. you should really just go talk to a lawyer. <laughs> so that was the last I talked to him. I don't know if he talked to a lawyer. I don't know if he fled to Malta. Um, I, I, but that was probably my most interesting one. That is hilarious. So, you know, I've been in the fintech space for more than a couple of years now. And I remember I would go to like Lend It and all these big fintech conferences. And in the expo hall, there would be like, you know, half a dozen AML KYC solutions. Um, and now with uh, this whole explosion around blockchain and ICOs and STOs, I feel like the conversation is coming back a lot and in many cases this is this is still just a reg tech conversation right what's the what's changed now now that you know blockchain and and all of the uh you know that type of technology is in the picture is there any change or are we are we is it just you know is that hype what what are we looking at here yeah well i mean so the biggest difference to a crypto company compared to say like a, a like a, a mortgage lending company or something like that, right? Like the previous generation of fintech companies is most of those companies launched in one or maybe two jurisdictions. And so their compliance policies and their compliance tools only, you know, only needed to be flexible to those couple of use cases. And then they would, you know, kind of grow it over time. Uh, the challenge that you run into in the crypto world, uh, there's, there's a bunch of challenges you run into in the crypto world. But one of the biggest challenges that you run into in the crypto world is that basically that in most cases, the day you open your doors, you're taking customers globally which um, compliance, as, as you know, is based both on where you are, but also where your customers are, right? And so, you know, for people that are operating outside of the United States, the minute you take one U.S. customer, you know, the, the Department of Treasury and all of our other federal organizations all claim jurisdiction over your organization. And the same is true that the EU does that you know, with their residents and citizens and China that, you know, in other places, the U.S. is the most aggressive about it, but a lot of places do it. And so you need to make sure that your policies and your tools and your personnel are all prepared to deal with a global basis. And, you know, by the way, the way that people are going to attempt to do fraud and end run the system is also going to be regional and cultural, you know, and based on the technologies that are available in that country, including the technologies that are built into their identification documents. So it's, it's you know, it's taking the problem that previous fintech companies had and, and you know, making it 200 times more complicated out of the gate. Interesting. So can you paint me a picture? What is different? How, how has the world changed or impacted by the convergence of blockchain technology and AML KYC law? How is the world impacted by the intersection of blockchain technology and AML and KYC law? So well, maybe not necessarily the laws themselves, but you know, the fact that 
you were now use, utilizing blockchain technology for AML KYC, like is are things done faster? Are there no transaction costs? What impact you? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's right now. It's more that AML and KYC policies are affecting blockchain than the other way around. Um, you know, I think, and you know, what you're seeing is um, twofold. Um, in one way, um, some uh, regulatory policy is slowing the growth and adoption of the industry by either being overly onerous or by having non-transparent policies in a way that uh, limit investment inside of that region or country. Um, in terms of the long run, I do believe that blockchain technology will have a impact on compliance from the perspective of um, public ledgers uh, change the way that auditing and watching of the network can be done. Um, you know, before, you know, tr transaction data was typically siloed um, inside of institutions or inside of private entities. And I think the ability to be able to watch and track uh, these flows on a transparent ledger is going to provide improvements and efficiencies for AML and KYC down the road. Interesting. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want to talk about? Um, you know, I think that, uh, one thing I just might want to touch on is that it, for me, this has been a really, really interesting, uh, space to work in from the perspective of, you know, blockchain and crypto is by default considered really high risk from an AML perspective because of its ability to easily and fluidly move across borders at high value. Um, and so, uh, um, it's actually meant it's been uh, it's been interesting playing the cat and mouse game with the the different bad guys that are out there, and that you know there's constant evolution where you know we come up with a solution to a problem, and the the bad guys you know come up with a new problem, and then we find a way to block that, and you know then there's something new that happens, and so. You know, I would encourage any of your listeners that are out there to make sure that they're constantly taking a look at and reevaluating their policies and their tools to see if they're meeting the current threats that are out there or if they've become stagnant in a way that have allowed the bad guys to, to kind of run or walk around their systems. Fantastic. How can our listeners find and follow you? Sure. So I'm on Twitter uh, at Justin W. Newton, N-E-W-T-O-N, or uh, you can find information about our company and reach out to me through our website at www.netki.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Justin. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So, um, so, you know, we have to go through the editing process and all that kind of stuff, but um, sure. I, it's probably going to come out in a couple weeks. I, when it does, I will ping you the link, and if you could share it, that would be awesome. I would love to share it as soon as it's out, so please let me know. Okay, sounds good. All right, take care. Great talking to you, Jamie. Bye-bye. Okay, all right, bye.